Hello everyone and welcome to my talk, Interrogating the Archive, Assessing Digital Language Repositories as Technology. The digital language repository is a relatively new technology. Seen as a key aspect of documentary approaches to linguistics, digital repositories serve to protect the linguistic and, at the same time, cultural resources of a community, often for both scientific inquiry and local use, and usually long into the future. Given their stated importance, this talk seeks to explore the digital language repository as a technology in a holistic and critical manner. This is carried out by first examining my own experience creating and curating archive collections of audiovisual language material from three language communities in north central Tanzania. Uh, secondly, uh, examining these archive collections through a set of questions attributed to Jacques Ellul. And three, suggesting future visions of digital repositories alive to the needs and desires of the local communities whose voices they preserve. First of all, however, a note on travel. I've come from a rather long way away today, and I recognize how much that this has cost, both in terms of money as well as in carbon, associated primarily with air travel between Germany and Indonesia. It really means a lot that I could come and speak to all of you in person like this, and I therefore really want to make sure that my being here in presence is of benefit to you. So please do ask me questions directly after I've finished. Pull me to one side in the margins of the main event, challenge me, ask for clarification. I want to make sure that my being here is worth the expense. Also, a recording of this talk will be made available shortly after its live presentation, both on Zenodo at the DOI Given, as well as on YouTube via the QR code on screen. And finally, a note on myself. I'm a linguist interested in the languages of the Tanzanian Rift, their documentation and description, their morphosyntax, and the histories and cultures of their speaker communities, especially as evinced through things like language contact and linguistic arts. This is an image taken in 2015 of me working with one of the Gorwa language consultants, Raheli Lawi, in Endebeg Village. Because I'll be talking about the three languages I work with and their speakers in this talk, I'd like now to show you an example of how each looks and sounds. So here's a clip of Gorwa, which is a Cushitic language spoken in and around Babati district. This clip is of consummate storyteller Bejero Quezo talking about the prophet Sagilo Magena. <laughs> Hello, Segilo Agu, Hazua, my Imburu. Segilo Matatelo, our tail, Gar singer at Amsio, Segilo Matatelo, our tail, Segilo na u Hayada. Now I look Momokusagi, what is the same of five Sarigira? Does it was a same in Atiri? Hm, five Sarigira, Hayadin now. Can no more Fakis get out? And <laughs> And this clip is of Ihanzu, a Bantu language spoken in Mkalama district, and is of Rahema Rajabu talking about when she participated in rainmaking rituals. <laughs> Embura ke simbulia Omongwe Nwarira Mm Omongwe ulele no taki Ke nunga mongwa ke ndiri ndiri No taki Mm Pak 
Finally, this clip is of Hadza, a language isolate spoken around Lake Ayasi, and is a recording of Ate Pandisha talking about taboos associated with hunting. <laughs> I'd like to set up this talk by giving a bit of detail on my history with digital language repositories and what exactly they are. My first experiences in building a digital language repository began in 2012 when I started working with the Gorwa speaker community. Uh, making recordings of their language within the framework of a project to describe the language. Um, in 2018, the model I was using changed significantly. Instead of going out and doing all the recording myself, I trained four speakers of Gorwa to not only record the audiovisual material in their language, but also to choose for themselves what they thought was important to include in the documentation. This resulted not only in more recordings, but recordings rendered richer by the context that these local researchers already knew on the community they were working with, their own communities. Uh, this insider-led model was adopted from uh, the beginning with uh, the Ihanzu and Hadza-speaking communities when documentation began there, both in 2019. And what kind of things ended up in the archive from these projects? So here's a brief showreel put together by my colleague Richard Griscom, exemplifying some of the material recorded by the Hadza local researchers. All of this material forms the bulk of three digital language repositories, all housed with the ELAR, the Endangered Languages Archive, or ELAR for short. If we visit one of the deposit web pages, uh, we encounter a website that looks like this, uh, with information on what is inside, a search bar, as well as links to the individual recordings. Uh, if we click on one of these recordings, we are brought to a page uh, which includes more explanation on what the recording is about. We call this metadata, uh, as well as the recordings themselves. So in this case, we have both an audio file and a video file. If we click on, say, the video file, we can then both see a thumbnail of the video, as well as watch the video using controls here at the bottom. Uh, crucially, we can also download the video for further analysis and use. These archive deposits are large, comprising hundreds of hours of recorded material each. And indeed, they are large compared to many similar deposits made around the same time. I should say, however, that size is only one way to measure the deposit, and things such as richness of descriptions as well as diversity of recordings are also important factors. Uh, what I'd like to talk about today is the language archive itself. I feel that this often takes a backseat to the actual recordings, so today we'll focus on the repository in which those recordings exist. So, having provided some context, I would like now to assess the digital language repositories as technology. 
Uh, today, I'll be assessing the archive using a series of questions attributed to the philosopher and theologian Jacques Ellul. Uh, there are 76 questions in total, uh, which can be grouped into subcategories including social, moral, ethical, practical, vocational, metaphysical, political, aesthetic, and ecological. Uh, obviously, uh, these are far too many questions for us to seriously engage in in the span of one presentation, so we'll be taking a handful from the total. So, for example, let's choose this one, which asks, is it ugly? Um, again, these questions are meant to be applicable to any kind of technology, so we could look at an iPhone and ask, is it ugly? I mean, with a sleek, professionally uh, developed design, one could say that the iPhone is beautiful. Um, we could then move on to the very next question on the list. Does it cause ugliness? Um, in this case, the iPhone would fare much worse. The iPhone could be argued to be the cause of a whole host of invasive and antisocial ugliness in our world today. Uh, so let's now apply the same two questions to the digital language repository. So the first question, is it ugly? I mean, looking at the website itself, and again, not what it holds, I don't think that this would win any awards for aesthetic impact. Uh, moving to the next question, however, I think it fares better. Does it cause ugliness? When I think about the learning, the connections made, as well as the ways in which it has allowed the language communities to uncover the considerable cultural richness often hidden in plain sight, I think that the archive has caused considerable beauty in its creation and use. Perhaps, however, the ultimate answer to this question will lie in how the archive is used in the future. Having demonstrated our process today, let's take another question. Uh, what is the purpose of the digital language repository? On the website of the archive, which houses the repositories on which I've worked, it states explicitly that the purpose is preserving endangered languages. This, I think, is consistent with my experience using the archive. All three of the languages I've worked with are endangered. The question of whether the, di the digital repositories are preserving the languages themselves, as opposed to recordings of the languages, is a rather different question. And perhaps the best answer right now is this remains to be seen. With that said, I, I think recent research shows positive signs that this could become the case, however. We'll talk about this in addressing a new question here, which asks, does it build on or contribute to the renewal of traditional forms of knowledge? Now, in recent work conducted together with my colleagues Bonnie Sands and Richard Griscom, we looked at every case, both historical and up to the present day, of language reawakening efforts on the African continent. Um, what we saw was that language communities who had managed to preserve some form of their language, either in written records, liturgical registers, or in recordings, could reintroduce varieties of their language most directly connected to those used by their ancestors or predecessor uh, populations. Uh, without documentation, however, this was impossible. So, I mean, this may seem self-evident, but to my knowledge, this is the first time that it's been asserted through observation that existing records are beneficial to reawakening projects. Another question asks, where is it used? Well, the answer for the repositories I work with is primarily in the West. Tanzania is in the bottom 25% of countries in terms of internet usage. And because these repositories are digital, there are real issues of access for Tanzanians. An associated question might be, uh, does it concentrate or equalize power? Clearly, by making the majority of the recordings open access, anyone can theoretically access and use the materials. However, because of issues of the practicality of accessing the internet, again, this really just remains an idealization. A further associated question that may be asked is, does it require or institute a knowledge elite? This is certainly the case for the digital language repository. 
Save for short summaries written in the national language Swahili, the rest of the data descriptions, as well as the wider interface, is written in English. This means that, on top of internet access, being able to use the repositories relies on an understanding of English, which could, in the local contexts in which I work, be reasonably described as an uncommon skill, only normally achieved by a subset of generally privileged people. Moving on, a further question we can examine is, what are its effects on relationships? In my experience, I have observed that during the work of creating the repository, as well as during the work of sharing its contents and understanding them, many opportunities have arisen for the local researchers to spend time with and learn from their friends, neighbors, and relatives, and indeed for many Gorwa people to actively participate in this process of learning. Uh, I've spoken about this in a further talk, which can be uh, watched uh, by visiting the QR code on screen, but Pascal Bu's experience recording the songs of his, his father is one example of this. An associated question asks, does it undermine conviviality? We'll adopt a definition from Ivan Illich, which, where conviviality means something like the ability of individuals to interact creatively and uh, autonomously with others and their environments to satisfy their individual and collective needs. Uh, this is a valid challenge. When using a digital repository, the process of accessing stories, songs, and other linguistic arts of these three language communities ha has been reduced, and I use the term reduced consciously, to a process of accessing them on the internet, on a laptop, computer, or phone, for example. In the past, however, such resources were only ever accessible through visiting the people who knew them, traveling to them, sitting down with them, and listening to them on a person-to-person -person basis. So in this way, the digital repository could represent a step back from this kind of convivial dynamic, and this is something to seriously consider. A final question we'll consider here today is, does it serve to commodify knowledge or relationships? We can see here that within the Ihanzu deposit, knowledge about agriculture has been sorted, tagged, and made available at the checking of a box. By selecting this tag in the digital repository, all recordings having to do with agriculture in the speech community are made available. Without going into too much detail here, I wonder if this makes this knowledge seem rather like a string of products rather than instantiations of an integrated system. And I wonder if this individuation is not a first step along a climb towards commodification. We could indeed continue with these questions attributed to Elul for the rest of the day, but I hope that in discussing these salient few, we have some idea of what this exercise sets out to accomplish and what some of the issues inherent to the digital repository may be. Uh, given the time, however, I think it would be prudent to briefly move on to imagining ways forward. I've asserted in previous talks that I do not see a future in which technology will be the only or perhaps even the most important feature of digital language repositories. In a similar vein, I hope that today has helped us reflect on the fact that no technology is neutral and that even something like a digital language repository, essentially a specialized kind of website, must be understood as a tool that brings both benefits as well as challenges for use. During our assessment, we saw that again and again, a major issue of the digital language repository had to do with accessibility, and perhaps more broadly, integration with the life ways and perhaps even philosophies of knowledge and learning of local speaker communities. These would seem to be important, important factors to consider when seeing the repository as an effective and meaningful technology for the language community whose resources it preserved. In another recent talk, I spoke about the potential of viewing digital language repositories as libraries, and this is a metaphor about which I'm considerably excited. Uh, more about this exercise as seeing archive as library can be viewed by the following Q QR code on screen, but I feel that any approach which brings the digital language repository or its derivative works closer to the speaker community practically, philosophically, physically, could go a long way in 
rising to some of the challenges inherent in this kind of technology. Finally, I'd like to thank my friend and colleague Richard Griscom for some of the media used in this talk. Raheli Lawi, Emmanuel Marco, Dira Michai, and Augustino Amos Caguema all appear in images in this talk, and I would like to acknowledge them for that. Uh, thanks are also due to Pascal Bu'u, Stefano Edward, Christina Guai, Festo Masani, Samuel Isia, Sara Kalael, Mariamu Anyawire, Bunga Paolo, Endeko Simon, Nange Chaka, Angela Sampson, Jacobo Lubumba, and Elizabeth Minja, the local researchers who took part in their respective Gorwa, Hadza, and Ihanzu language documentation projects. Also, I would like to thank all the Gorwa, Hadza, and Ihanzu people who contributed their time and knowledge to the language documentation projects. Finally, Julians, Barantika, Bella Kammerling, and Mary Nijikulu were central to my participation in this event, and I would like to thank them for all of their work and help in this. Thank you, uh, and here are my references.